This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. Hello, this is Dr. Jonathan Abel, and I'm here with Dr. Angela Riato. Hello. And also with Dr. Bill Nance. Hello. And we are going to talk with Dr. Riato about one of the topics that she studies, which is a lesser known but very important part of the Civil War, and that's Civil War prisoners. Uh, so let, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, around how many prisoners of war were there during the Civil War? No, that's a great question. And again, thank you for having me do this. I'm super excited. Um, so let's just start with a nice round number of 410,000 were held prisoner. Um, and about 56 of 56,000 of them are going to die in confinement. I do say it's a sticky number, though, because we had for a period of time exchanges. Mm-hmm. So 410,000 were held prisoner, but 674,000 military personnel were taken prisoner, but some were exchanged almost immediately after capture or sent to parole camps and never actually sat in a prison camp. Now, is that a whole number both north and south, or is that a specific side? No, that is the entire number. So uh, the 674,000, 462,000 are Confederates, 211,000 are Union, um, a total of 247,000, almost 248,000 Confederates were paroled on the battlefield. Um, as were about 17,000 federal troops. That leaves then the 410,000 actually taken to prisoner of war camps. So if I'm remembering correctly, there's about 3 million men who fight in the Civil War, all told? Yep, and it could be even higher because then you have people that weren't recorded. Mm -hmm. So basically we're we're saying that about 10% of all people, maybe as many as 15%, as much as 15%, were taken prisoner. It's a significantly high number, yes. Okay, so let's let's talk about the very basics. Um, I, I, our listeners are probably somewhat familiar with what a Civil War battlefield might look like, um, you know, Gettysburg or, or Vicksburg or something like that. So how did somebody manage to find themselves a prisoner of war in the Civil War? Okay, so that's, that's a very fascinating question with a complicated answer, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I actually study prisoner of war narratives. So the memoirs, um, reminiscences that they wrote after they were released or escaped from prison. So some of them could be as early as 1861, but up to 1930. So I track narrative construction, um, and narratives might differ from reality. Um, so let's talk about reality and then we'll talk a little bit about narrative and how they say they became prisoners. Um, so the basic one is you were surrendered by your commanding officer. So for example, if you were perhaps encircled, um, and the commanding officer, whatever rank at that time, um, decided that it was going to be futile to keep resisting, they would surrender their forces. Typical story. We've seen this throughout history. Um, Some then were you could be actually captured, and there's a difference, I think, between surrender and capture, um, where it's like when you are surrendered, you don't have a lot of agency in that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And in capture, it's the idea that you fought back. You resisted until the very end, and then you were captured. You never surrendered. So if I'm understanding you correctly, being surrendered is kind of a corporate thing, whereas being captured is perhaps a more individual thing? You could thing. say that if you wanted to. It's not saying that individuals did not surrender. Some did, but the idea of capture is that I, you know, I was captured against my will. Um, I was captured trying to help a loved one. So some of the stories you hear is, um, for example, on parole or on picket duty where you're very much alone, um, easily captured, right, quickly encircled by a handful of the enemy, taken captured um taken by surprise Mm -hmm. um so those are a few um being wounded Mm -hmm. or disabled in some way um this is we see traumatic brain injuries at this time even though they didn't really understand it um so being concussed Mm -hmm. and being um taken um as prisoner those are all ways to become a prisoner of war 
Um, other ones, especially the ones that I see in narratives, is helping a wounded member mm-hmm. of maybe your company or your unit, usually dear friends or family members. So one of the persons um, that I look at his memoir, he says that he was helping his brother who was severely wounded and he didn't want to leave his side. Mm-hmm. Um, and when the enemy came about him, he had to be like torn away from his dying brother. And if I'm remembering correctly, throughout the Civil War, units are raised locally. Yes. So it, it's not uncommon for people to have friends and family in their oh, same, no. maybe even their same platoon. Yeah, usually same town, same county. Mm-hmm. Um, until conscription increases um, mid war until the end, but again, usually people are from the exact same town, mm-hmm. um, or at least the same county or surrounding counties. So those are stories. Um, ones again, just taken by surprise, like oh, I went out to go get some food and was captured. Um, mm-hmm. I was going to the bathroom and I was captured. My favorite is how many infantrymen claim that their horses abandoned them (laughs) and that's how they were captured which is laughable because i wonder how many infantrymen actually had horses right which is i mean it's the equivalent of somebody owning a very expensive car today yeah but again it's they weren't so they weren't surrendered they were captured because their horse abandoned them right right so a lot of people claim that they were captured they didn't surrender so, the, Dr. Nance, I'm going to pause real, here, real quick here. You are a veteran of the global war on terror. So, how does this civil war experience of perhaps being on patrol by yourself or using a latrine by yourself and being captured, how does that compare to a more modern um, U.S. experience of a soldier on a battlefield in danger of or perhaps being captured? It happens, uh, and we don't. Uh, it, now, grant, uh, thankfully, it's been fairly rare over the past several years. But, uh, but the example of the soldier wandering off to go use the latrine or to go relieve himself, or uh, because there really aren't too many latrines out there, yep. uh, that does happen. Uh, a small outpost falling asleep or being caught unawares. Uh, a very famous incident occurred uh, in Iraq, and I want to say uh, right around the surge time frame, around 2005. Uh, it had a very tragic result in there because most of the people we were fighting didn't hold on to prisoners. Uh, so the, the, the circumstances, or what people say happened, are entirely believable. Like, I, I always chuckle because, you know, it's you're always caught in the most awkward... Uh, the enemy chooses the most awkward time to decide that they want to do something, and you're caught and you have to react. What about... So that's that covers kind of the, the captured part, but what about this idea of surrendering, particularly a large unit? Um, really, the last time you really see a U.S. Army unit surrender, um, maybe Korea. Uh, I don't... Uh, to my knowledge, um, the USS Pueblo, as a as a for mm-hmm. instance, would be a uh, would be a naval a case of a naval example. Mm-hmm. And they weren't even considered prisoners of war; they were considered spies. Yeah. Um, so, I met one of the USS Pueblo survivors a few years ago, and he does he had to even apply for a different sort of pension because in the records he was never listed as a prisoner of war. So, Vietnam, any? Uh, Maybe individuals, Maybe. but not a large unit. In Vietnam, you have the individuals who are captured, mainly air crew. You've mm-hmm. got a couple uh, special forces camps that are overrun. Same thing with uh, like the uh, the the cap platoons with the Marines. But again, not yeah, entire divisions. No, they like, were very the, small. The, the last mass surrender of U.S. forces was probably Korea, where you had some of the uh, elements of the Eighth Army getting uh, overrun in the first parts of the Chinese mm-hmm. offensive. Some smaller instances throughout the Chinese intervention, and then of course there's the famous example of uh, the 106th Infantry Division of the Schnee Eifel. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, there really aren't. A so this is late 1944. We're correct. talking World War II. We're, we're, yeah, we're talking World War II was the last time yeah. you see extensive cases. Korea, you could find enough that you could say it was like regimental combat teams, yeah. smaller. Yeah, no. So in the Civil War, you would see um, entire regiments. Uh, the 16th Connecticut was largely captured whole um, in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you will see entire units, um, raiders captured. So um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, Earl Van Dorn, they have several examples where they kind of deceived the enemy into surrendering entire cavalry units to them. Mm-hmm. So you will see... Um, 
quite large numbers. Captured after the first battle of Bull Run, mm-hmm. Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, Vicksburg, right? And you you bring up another example there that that belongs more to so I'm an 18th century historian belongs more to my period than perhaps more modern ones, um, and that is after a siege. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Vicksburg, and if I remember correctly, it's it's a pretty substantial number of Confederates who surrender in the city, right? Something like 25,000. Um, so that you might get a mass of prisoners that come from the surrender of a city. Exactly. So even after, um, so if you guys are familiar with Forts Henry and Forts Donaldson, that Ulysses S. Grant is going to um, capture in 1862, um, you have 15,000 prisoners from those two forts. Um, and in early 1862, the U.S. government and the Confederate governments are not prepared for that high number of prisoners. They were barely prepared for like the 1,500 taken at the first battle of Bull Run. Mm-hmm. Um, they thought the war was going to be quick, and they also weren't expecting to see these very large numbers of individuals being surrendered all at one time. Okay, so let's kind of take it. So the act of surrender or surrendering or I was, captured. I was captured. Can you, uh, what did the narrative say or what do you have on kind of the mechanical process of soldiers on battlefield all the way back to soldier is in a prison camp? And then we'll, uh, then once we get done with that, I want to kind of talk about what's the difference between being captured and paroled. But let's cover the mechanical piece first. Um, so actually from taking prisoner to ending up in a camp? Like say Andersonville or something along those lines. Okay. Um, so... Again, it's, it depends on what part of the war we're talking about. Okay, so that's a that's a great question. So um, early on in the war, again, they're not really prepared for a high number of prisoners. They're expecting that they're going to follow a historical example, so American Revolution of War of 1812, where you would be given an oath of parole, um, which actually is a sheet of paper with your name on it, your date, and it says oath of parole. It should, it should be worth mentioning here. In, in French, parole means more than just we think of it, which is a conditional release from prison. It's it's essentially a legal document that lets you do certain things. So it's, it's a broader sense than just uh, the way we think of it today. Oh, see? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, what's the French word? Same word. We oh, took it straight from French. Parole. It's par- parole. Parole. Okay, see? Um, and it just says that you will not participate in any hostilities... Um, until you arrive at a pro camp or back to your unit. And they're like, this is how we're going to deal with it. If there were larger numbers, um, there would be a type of exchange based on a scale of equivalence. So um, I bring this up in talk sometimes, but if you guys remember the great movie The Patriot, um, where Mel Gibson character tricks them into doing a parole, um, a prisoner exchange, and he's like, I have, you know, two colonels, one lieutenant colonel, three captains, and one guy who called me like a surly fellow or whatever. A cheeky fellow. A cheeky fellow, yes, thank you. Um, And he wants his 12 guys back. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Um, And it would also be a scale, so colonel for a colonel, or maybe 12 privates for a colonel. And it should be worth pointing out, too, what, what the character does is not something most officers would have done, because that would have been incredibly dishonorable. Yeah, and not very manly. Right, um, right, right. Yes. But it's still a great story. Yeah. Um, talking about honor, we can definitely talk about that today, too. So that's how they started the war. They're like, hey, it worked in American Revolution. It worked in the War of 1812. We'll do it again. Again, it makes sense until you have high numbers of prisoners. So just a few handful here and there. Um, you might keep them overnight near your camp under guard, hand them the oath of parole, and then they would be processed. Um, as more and more prisoners um, are being captured, where do you put them? So mm-hmm. then you start putting them in camps. Um, and these are camps that have already existed. So uh, Camp Chase in Ohio, um, Camp Douglas in Chicago. Many of these already existed as training camps. You'd put them in there. And then you would send them onto an exchange camp like Annapolis, where it's actually called Camp Exchange, Annapolis, Maryland. And then they would shift. Um, so again, taken prisoner on the battlefield. Um, usually kept under guard near the site of the battlefield, usually just sent to the rear under guard. Um, Held there a few days, you would be fed, you'd be taken care of, especially um, early in the war where both armies actually had sufficient resources. Um, 
often prisoners would say they were very well treated by people at the front because they kind of recognized what they had been through. It was not until their hardship started until later when they were under maybe prisoner guards or and home guards. unlike many wars, they all speak the same language and are from very similar backgrounds. Yeah. With, with one exception we'll come to later, but... Yeah, and so they would often then be given their oath of parole or sent to an exchange camp. Um, they would be marched um, or rail, right? So rail lines, um, especially depending if you were in the Eastern Theater, that you could just be sent on a rail car and then sent to kind of a terminus and then unload it to a camp. Makes sense. Um, but that is going to change when the exchange breaks down in mid-1863, and then there's no oath of parole anymore. There is no exchange camps except for extremely ill people. Um, often people who are close to death or people that probably shouldn't have been taken as prisoner, like chaplains or doctors, but were taken anyway. Um, and then you are sent to prisoner of war camps like the infamous Andersonville. Now let's take that uh, step a little a step further because the U.S. Army was notoriously very, very small mm-hmm. prior to the uh, Civil War. And the structures you're talking about imply a sophistication of military organization that belies a much larger, much more professional force. Mm -hmm. So how do I go from a bunch of regiments that are raised out of local counties and uh, states and with maybe one or two professional officers in an entire regiment or division to a structure where now I've got, where I'm putting people onto train cars, I'm guarding them the whole way, I'm putting them into organized uh, camps. Is there, have you gone into any of that part of the structure of how that kind of came about? And the staff work that goes into that. So, oh, yes. no, that's a, that's a great question as well. I love this, guys. Um, so when it first starts out, they are going to rely on the quartermaster system because this is what, again, they used in the American Revolution, they used in the War of 1812. They assume that the quartermaster general will be able to handle this. Uh, surprise, it can't, right? They don't, um, they don't have the expertise. They don't have the resources. They don't have the personnel. Um, the training. The training. So as the war intensifies and there's more prisoners, field commanders can't facilitate all the informal exchanges or formal exchanges that they're going to have to do. They are going to set up both governments, are going to set up a commissary general of prisoners just to handle prisoner exchanges, paroles, and camps. And that's going to be as early as 1862, early 1862, um, because they... They just cannot handle the huge numbers and, again, the training, the people who don't actually have experience. The best thing is that Commissary General Prisoners for the United States is William Hoffman. And William Hoffman had experience um, as like a camp administrator in the Western states throughout like the Mexican-American War and the period leading up to the Civil War. So he is kind of like one of the best guys for the job because he knows how to balance resources, money he's kind of like a camp accountant um he even goes as in detail as to like how to set up the camps he designs the camps themselves how many latrines um they should have um how much how many calories prisoners can have during various seasons and then how much he can cut from the budget as part of retaliation like he is into it so he's like the perfect man for the job Um, but it's definitely um a kind of a struggle getting there because they're not prepared exactly like you said. So, I mean, what you're basically talking about is creating an entire prison system. Oh yeah. From scratch. From scratch. And it's 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 an interesting point that you're not talking about taking people in from the civilian prison system because it essentially didn't exist. There are penitentiaries. Uh, the most famous one is the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus. They do send people there for a small period of time because okay, I think I briefly mentioned it. So a lot of the camps are initially going to use. Um, that are camps, I'm doing air quotes, are training camps that were set up to train and prepare soldiers to go fight a war because, again, they're building a huge army. Training camps, POW camps. A lot of soldiers would agree. Yeah, right? They're, <laughs> they, can, they have barracks. It works. Um, or tents. Um, so they're kind of hodgepodging together. The Confederacy um, has a handful of training camps, but oftentimes they're just um, – acquiring buildings so the famous one like Libby prison in Richmond or Castle Thunder in Richmond or old tobacco warehouses along the river uh, Bell Isle that they're eventually going to use for um, enlisted personnel is just in the middle of the river you can go there now it's a famous swimming place in Richmond I don't recommend it because you're swimming next to a cemetery but who cares um, but they're just kind of using whatever fortifications they have whatever the buildings they have 
Um, so not only do they have to build prison camps from scratch, but they also do have to build everything else that goes along with taking care of hundreds of thousands of prisoners. And these are the equivalent of building a town from scratch. This is not just finding a place for them to sleep. You have to oh, yeah, provide for you need... sanitation, you have to provide for food. Yeah, they would call, um, so we say latrines, they called them sinks at the time, um, and because that would where you would do all your business. Not only go to the bathroom, but wash your hair, you shave, everything that you would do in sinks. Um, so yeah, you had to make sure that there was fresh water nearby, you had to make sure that it could, there was enough um, wood right? So for fires and for building materials. Um, You also had to make sure that it wasn't too close to um, civilian society, that so you had some semblance of control and isolation over these individuals. So yeah, um, it is it is a challenge. So um, one I was just Before we started, Dr. Abel, we were talking about Point Lookout. So Point Lookout is in Maryland. It's actually at the very tip of of a peninsula, um, maybe an hour, hour and a half south of Washington, Mm -hmm. D.C. It's in the middle of nowhere. At the very tip of the peninsula, it's only like three yards wide, right? And this is where they decide to put the prisoner of war camp. Um, It floods regularly, but the idea was, hey, it's near water, so you can easily transport prisoners in. Um, They can't easily escape, right, because they're isolated. Um, But you can also bring resources in. It was wooded. um, And so it seemed to be the perfect place, which on paper, it is the perfect place until you get there and you realize most of it's underwater. There's really bad diseases. um, It's a little too isolated. It's a swamp. It's a swamp. There's storms that hit it. And escape is a real problem because these are all guys that look and talk like the local civilian populace in most cases. Now, the Southern Drawl is gonna sp- gonna uh, gonna stand out, say in Maine, but say in Maryland or Pencil- Southern Pennsylvania, not so much. Well, so no, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a funny story to tell you. Um, and I think there's many reasons for this. One, again, this is the 19th century. Uh, they don't have TV. They don't have radio. Um, so the idea of being like provincial and not really knowing accents is really a thing. Like sometimes people have never even left their hometown. Um, so the idea of a southern drawl, they don't know what that would sound like until they actually meet someone. Crazy story, though. Um, one Confederate prisoner, again, this is a story he has told the world, but it's still hilarious. His name is Decimus et Ultimus Barziza. His parents had 10 children and they were like you are the 10th and tenth, last 10th and final right um decimus at ultimus barziza he is captured um he is at johnson's island um wait no yeah he's at johnson's island and i think they're taking to point lookout or the other way around but they have him on a train going through central pennsylvania he jumps off the train in central pennsylvania actually near huntingdon pennsylvania where my um, alma mater is juniata college middle of mountains of pennsylvania he jumps off He starts wandering through. He finds a town, and he's like, I need food, I need something. He gets into a cafe in this town, and there are Union soldiers in the cafe. And he is disheveled, what have you. I think maybe at one point he may have found civilian clothes. He starts, not to seem suspicious, he starts talking to these individuals. (laughs) He is from Texas. And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm on leave. I'm traveling back to see my family. And they're like, oh, where are you from? And he goes, Massachusetts. And he goes, I could tell. He's like, I could tell from your accent from anywhere. I knew you were from Massachusetts. And so the humor of mistaking someone from Texas Mm -hmm. for someone from Massachusetts is hilarious. But perhaps at the time, maybe these people were kind of militia from central Pennsylvania, had probably never traveled outside their town, had only ever heard Pennsylvania accents, mm-hmm. and they just knew it was a different accent. So maybe it is probable that could have happened. And you can picture that as a movie scene, right? Oh, it's fantastic. It's perfect. So you you brought up something I think is worth discussing at least a little bit, and, and Dr. Nance, you can, you can speak to this. Um, today, we teach soldiers to actively resist being captured, mm-hmm. including after they've been captured. Seer training. Right. The, the world we're talking about in the U.S. Civil War is a very different one. It's one that's considered to be more gentlemanly, although we can question that narrative. Uh, but when an officer, especially, or a soldier surrenders, the idea is that they owe a certain level of fidelity to the side they're surrendering to. It's so a, can you uh, talk a little bit about what the, what the prisoner expected his own responsibility to be? Um, so, yeah, so... 
again, narrative is different, but the idea that you are honorable. Uh, even during the war and after the war, prisoners are going to argue that just because they were captured or surrendered does not mean they were any less manly, right? Um, and some Explicitly argue, so, correct? Explicitly so. Um, they would use that exact language that we are still a man, we are still um, a soldier, we are still an officer, we still are honorable veterans. And one way to show this is that they were calm upon capture, um, they were polite upon capture, um, that they didn't, what did I go say, they didn't swear, that was a big one, no swearing, no drinking, no gambling, like they weren't given to any maybe animalistic desires or deviant behavior, that they were still upstanding citizens even though they were captured. Um, some of this will change, right, as the war continues, and especially if you're in Camp Douglas or Elmira or Andersonville or Cahaba, which are particularly terrible places. Um, and after years of being imprisoned, you know, kind of things go out. We see this throughout history. Um, but then they'll still say, well, I might have sworn or I might have stopped reading my Bible, but it's because of this situation. Um, I might have stolen that piece of bread or stolen that piece of wood, but it's because to help someone out. I may have taken that, um, some people would take oaths to prison commandants to get extra work to go outside the walls, um, which was seen as dishonorable because you were collaborating with the enemy, but most people would say, no, it's because my buddy in my tent was dying and I did it because I could get an extra ration to help him survive. So, so you're getting at the, the, the there's a very strong social moral code that these guys, even if they may not have always adhered to it, when they were writing their accounts later on, were fully aware of and were kind of defensive about and uh, in justification. Is that where you're going yep. with that? Yep, and also, um you have to, like Dr. Abel brought up earlier, so some of these individuals are captured with people they know. So also the idea that news of how they behaved got back to their loved ones at home and might um, darken their reputation or and even the, fa exactly, the family's reputation was a very real fear for many of these individuals. So again, like people who are captured with friends, family, or entire units, um, one, they survive. They have a higher rate of survival, mostly because they're with people think because of that community um, attachment and being taken care of by a group, but also maybe because they didn't let themselves break down into depression or giving up completely because they had this understanding of what was expected of them as 19th century men. Mm -hmm. Now you keep kind of referring to a shift. And there I'm is gonna, a shift. And, and, I, and I want to kind of kind of pick at that just a little bit because you're talking about, okay, there there's an, there's parole and then there's exchange until they don't. Until uh, they don't. And then they're treating people politely until they don't. So can you, now some of us can probably kind of guess why that is, but let's kind of pull that apart. And is it a, like, can you snap a chalk line, say on this day, or is it kind of a Brent and band? Um, no. So that, it, you are... Yes, you are exactly right. So I would maybe there's an exact date, but May of 1863, let's say. Um, so they realize informal paroles aren't working. Um, they and why aren't they working? Just because there's too many. There's too many prisoners. There's just too many. Um, you cannot expect a colonel on the ground or a brigadier to be able to handle 15,000 prisoners. Um, they they're still um, part of operations. They can't dedicate enough men to guard them and transport them. It's just too much. So they're like, we're going to do a formal exchange. Are, are, there, are people violating paroles? Pretty yeah, frequently? of course. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes they don't even go home. They go straight back to their units, which is, ex you know, I would too. Let's be honest. Um, it's like, oh, I don't. Or they would just actually go home and not report back to their unit because they're like, hey, I got free leave. Right. right. Um, so they said they're going to do a formal exchange cartel. They're going to take Major General David Harvey Hill from the Confederates, uh, Major General John Dix from the United States. Um, they're actually going to sit together for over um, six months of negotiation to come up with a formal cartel called the Dix Hill Cartel. Um, and it is going to work remarkably well. Um, in less than a year, between July of 1862 and May of 1863, over 20,000 Confederates are released and 12,000 Union prisoners had released. Most prison camps are empty, right? Um, by May of 1863. What changes is 
the enlistment and recruitment of African American soldiers. So, um, the United States is going to start um, recruiting and enlisting African American soldiers, uh, the U.S. Colored Troops, and President Davis. Um, shortly afterwards says that any captured Union African American troops would be treated as runaway slaves um, and that means either they would be killed or returned to slavery. Um, there is going to be some issues between um, Pope, um, General Pope and General Butler and Abraham Lincoln and they're going to kind of push back. Eventually Davis is going to repeal his statement um, but is going to keep accelerating until they're going to have to at least publish the idea that there should be some sort of guidelines for their treatments of prisoners of war. Um, and saying, like, you cannot kill or enslave people in the United States uniform, right? Um, Davis is going to double down and then says um, they also even white officers in charge, in command of black troops would also be treated like their slaves captured in Inciting arms. Inciting a slave rebellion. Yep. Um, that they could also either be killed or sent to slavery. Um, and this is considered raising the black flag. Um, the U.S. government is going to publish General Orders Number 100, also known as the Lieber Code, after its main author, Francis Lieber, in April of 1863. So April 24th, 1863, this now is official guidelines to handle prisoners of war, um, handle guerrillas, um, states within rebellion, right? The reason I said there's no clear date, however, is that's April 24th that is issued. By the time it gets around to the field, it's sometimes as late as July. Mm -hmm. um, but this is saying exchanges are done. The Dix Hill Cartel has Dix Hill Cartel has been suspended until the Confederacy agrees to treat African Americans the same as whites. As people. As people. What do you think happens then to the numbers of prisoners? <laughs> they skyrocket. I suspect they the Confederacy does not start doing that. No, it skyrockets. So what's fascinating is is that you would think at, from the Union perspective, or for the United States perspective, they, they would sit there and go, well, the South has got a very small white population, so if I just hold on to their people, eventually they run out of people. So what you're saying is that really was not the uh, kind of the first and foremost thought. Nope, nope. It's a happy accident, perhaps. It's, but it's a happy accident. Um, so the, yeah, so one is before Emancipation Proclamation, recruitment, and formation of black regiments. Um, Lincoln is also going to even... Um, encourage a change in policy further in July of 1863, um, where he says, for every Union prisoner killed or enslaved, federal authorities will kill or impress a Confederate soldier. It's it's worth pointing out this is immediately after Vicksburg and Gettysburg, so he's, he's kind of feeling himself here. Yeah. Um, he eventually is going to um, adjust that because Davis is going to withdraw his initial order, but Confederates are also going to continue to kill and enslave individuals. Um, you have heard horror stories about Fort Pillow. There's um, the crater at Petersburg. There are unfortunately too many examples of um, African-American troops who are surrendered or captured and immediately killed or um, sent into hard labor. So this is a way to protect against that. Um, and then you're also hearing even more reports of atrocities against African-Americans in the newspapers. So it's kind of this nasty cauldron of racial violence and uh, retaliation. I want to go back to what you said, Dr. Nance, though, about um, the idea that the Confederates have less people and that we could just send them to prisoner war camps, they will go not back to fighting. That is um, based in truth, but it's also a myth of the lost cause um, created by lost causers. So Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, is going to say something like that during the Vicksburg campaign. He says they parole people and they just go right back to the front lines. And he's like, I wish I could just keep them imprisoned, right? And wear down their personnel numbers. He does say that, but it's as early as like April, 1863, because he's just getting so fed up with the small numbers of prisoners they are taken, exchanging them because he doesn't have enough people to handle them. And then he sees them like back in the front lines. He does say that. However, he's only major general at the time, right? He doesn't have a lot of sway. He says it's about the same time the Lieber Code comes out. He is not really tracking the Lieber Code. Um, however, people in the post-war period are going to hear about this, 
and they are going to blame Grant for ending the exchanges, especially when he's running for presidential election. Yeah. Um, so not to say he, that he didn't say something like that. He did. Um, but during the war, if you look at documents from during the war, most people blame Lincoln, actually, and Stanton um, and Seward, or they blame Davis, depending on what side you're on. It's yeah. not until much later that they blame Grant. So this yeah. is uh, Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, and William Seward, Secretary of State, uh, and founder of the Republican Party. Um, y- you, you point out, of course, and let us never forget the role of the lost cause in Civil War history. Um, let's talk about the, the camps themselves. Okay. First of all, where are the camps in the, the United States and in the Confederacy? Oh, everywhere. Um, there's hundreds of camps. Again, they range from quite large camps that can hold uh, thousands of people to small camps that only care, um, hold 100. Um, they're broken up into officer and enlisted camps usually, um, but again, once the numbers skyrocket, you can't really um, divide them up that easily. Um, again, they start usually around hubs, so rail lines, um, waterways, ways to easily transport prisoners in. So I mentioned uh, many of the first ones for the Confederacy are in Richmond, in the capital city. Um, there's the Capitol Prison in Washington, D.C., uh, Fort McHenry, right? Um, fame of you, 1812 fame. Of 1812 fame was used. Um, Fort Delaware that you can actually, um, you can visit most of these still today. Um, these are just fortifications along the coast. Point Lookout, like I mentioned. These are just improvised prisons, Camp Chase. Uh, Camp Douglas, so in the Northeast. Um, In the South, like I said, mostly are in Richmond. However, Richmond is going to be um, considered the center of gravity for the Confederacy. So as more numbers are taken and there's more activities throughout the South and Southwest, if you want to say it, Southeast, um, the West of the Southeast, Mm -hmm. you're going to see camps pop up. You're going to see Camp Tyler um, or no, Camp Ford in Tyler, Texas. You're going to see um, a number in the New Orleans area. You're going to see, um, eventually we're gonna have Andersonville. Andersonville is created um, to handle the high number of prisoners held at Belle Isle and Libby and Castle Thunder. They are running out of room. Uh, and they also real want, it's in southwest Georgia, so they're thinking, hey, it's far out of the way of where Union forces can reach them. There can be no escape attempts. Um, and that's going to be in 1864. So we're going to have Andersonville, also known as Camp Sumter in southwest Georgia. You're going to have um, Cahaba, which is in Alabama. You're going to have Florence in South Carolina. You're going to have Salisbury, North Carolina. You're going to have Camp Make. There's so many, mm-hmm. right? Um, but as the war continues, they are going to start putting them in more isolated areas. Um, Elmira and Johnson's Island. Elmira is right on the border of Pennsylvania and New York. And then Johnson's Island is on actually a very small island called Johnson's Island in the middle of Lake Erie, um, kind of off the coast of Sandusky, Ohio. Um, and that's an officer's prison. And the idea, again, it's kind of out of nowhere. If they did escape, they probably can't get far. Um, it helps if there's water surrounding them. But the North actually has the resources to build something out to a re- uh, to a isolated area, whereas the South, when they put them out there, they just created another logistical problem for themselves. Yeah, so again, but they're still near hubs. So that's one thing. They might not be in Atlanta, but they're still near railway lines. So um, Andersonville, um, hi- it's, you can go visit. They have the National POW and MIA Museum down there. Highly recommend it to people who are listening. Um, it is near the Andersonville Depot. So again, it's it's called Camp Sumter. It is known as Andersonville because Andersonville is the town that's nearby and America's Georgia is 10 minutes down the road. They would be unloaded at the Andersonville Depot and they'd be walked down the hill, um, slightly uphill and then to the north gate of Andersonville Prison, which is just a wooden stockade in the middle of nowhere. There was two gates, the North Gate and the South Gate. North Gate was for people entering. South Gate was for people leaving, um, usually dead people leaving. Um, And to start, it was only 13 and a half acres. They realized they're running out of room. They decide to expand the stockade to 26 and a half acres, 
seems like a substantial room until you realize at in July of 1864 there are 33,000 people in 26 and a half acres in Which, southwest Georgia. This is probably one of the largest cities in the country at the time. Yes, it is massive. And as a point of reference, 26 acres is the size of a reasonably sized suburban neighborhood. Yeah, it's um, you can easily walk it. Um, people sometimes will go in the back way of Andersonville. Don't do that. Um, and they will walk around the camp in the morning because it's a nice little walk. It's nice and quiet. And when I say it's nice and quiet, it's actually very eerie at Andersonville. You don't really hear birds chirping still. Um, but you can easily walk it. You can also walk through the stockade itself. Um, there's a spring in the middle um, that you can walk down to and around and back up. It's very, very, very small. Um, and again, at its height, 33,000 people. Cahaba, also a very high number. Salisbury, very high number. Um, and because they're packed in here with not many resources, people are going to start dying at a very high rate. Um, Andersonville is open, I believe, in March of 1864. The first death happens in less than a month. So you, you, you mentioned, and for, for readers who, or listeners who may not be aware, Andersonville kind of becomes this notorious death camp. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it is sometimes compared to Nazi concentration camps, although there, there are differences, certainly. Um, but, but that brings us to the next obvious question, which is what is life like inside these camps, whether Andersonville or, or a United States camp? Um, horrific, maybe, if... Um that is a term that we feel comfortable using. Um, even in, let's say, even in a better camp, let's say um, in a camp that's actually in a building, let's say Libby Prison, right? It's an old tobacco warehouse, it's brick, it's wooden. Um, there are windows. Um, however, there's not a lot of circulation of the fresh air, right? Um, when we talk about latrines, usually they are buckets um, and there's not many. Um, uh, prisoners are not near allowed near the windows or they can get shot right um, they're not there is daily uh, checks on the prisoners so oftentimes they are left standing in place when they arrive many of them are stripped of any uh, personal materials um, personal belongings and that can go from everything from your pocket watch to your diary um, Jackets, shoes, whatever those the individuals in charge might want. Um, so again, stripped of identity. Um, we don't have interrogations. We you might have on the battlefield when someone's taken prisoner. You might have the occasional art. What unit are you from? Um, which way did you come from? But yeah, these men largely don't know anything. Right? Yeah, they largely don't know anything. And again, the idea of that unless you have someone very high ranking who might be a political officer or something you're not going to actually get a lot of information from them but you might get their money um so again stripped of identity stripped of personal belongings um even if you were wounded you were still sent to a prisoner of war camp so you have people who are wounded in these camps getting infections not a lot of fresh air uh not a lot of fresh water um the food is also not the best um later we're going to have retaliation policy where the food will be um, purposefully and deliberately reduced. Um, but it's just like you might get a serving of rice or grain, maybe some salt pork. Meat is not very common. Um, and so you're not having a very good... You're having people die um, of diseases and also of malnourishment. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say starvation. I'm, we're going to have starvation later, but there is a difference. Nutritional deficiency, by and large, things like pellagra or beriberi or, or but Exactly. Other. But as the things, all the staff work that we talked about before, is anytime you concentrate a huge group of people, or a large group of people even, into a concentrated space, sanitation and hygiene become problems almost immediately. Yeah, so Libby at least, or places like that, at least there's infrastructure, so they're not exposed to the elements. Not to say that they have heat, right? Many of the times they actually took the stoves out of the buildings um, for safety reasons, um, but still they have a roof over their head. Um, Which is not inhumane for the time, right? Yeah. So, so, so our listeners understand, it's normal for, for most people who lived in America at the time to not necessarily have a direct heat. And some people, yeah, and again, open windows, fire. open doors, right? Yeah. Um, then you have some camps, again, like Camp Chase, 
Johnson's Island, Elmira, where you have wooden barracks, um, Camp Delaware, wooden barracks, where they would maybe occasionally have stoves. Um, but again, still not the best nutrition. Um, waterborne illnesses and mosquito-borne illnesses. So um, well, and and uh, typhus, right? The the old term for typhus is camp fever. Yeah. Yep, yeah, typhoid fever. You would also have. So we usually, you know, diarrhea is a symptom. Dysentery. A lot of people would die of. Yeah. Um, Angel, quick question yeah. for you. Uh, and uh, this is actually for Dr. Abel and for yourself here, and because I want to get the 17th century perspective too, or the 18th century perspective. Um, how much of a new thing are mask uh, prison camps? Because we talked about the U.S. Army being r uh, very small and did not have the infrastructure really to build into this. So we're so we've got kind of the mo so kind of your end on kind of the modern aspect. But I'd also be interested for Dr. Abel's like prison camps a thing in the Napoleonic era or previous? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it it varies by where you are. So in the Napoleonic Wars, the British actually pioneered the modern prison camp. Um, and they've done some really good archaeology recently on digging them up. Um, because, it, you know, if you ever watch a show like Time Team, you can peel the turf back in Britain and find 2,000 years of history under it. Um, you literally peel the turf off. Uh, but before that, the, 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 if you had a coast, generally what you did is you took your old ships, you oh, demasted just... them, and you put people on them. They're called um, prison hulks or prison galleys. Before that, before the you know in the in the rowing um, the, the rowing ship areas of the Mediterranean, right? So you see that in Italy, you see it in Spain, you see a lot of it in France. And life on those was just as miserable as Dr. Riata was talking about. Um, basically, you went there to die. And if if you want to know what that looks like, watch the very beginning of the uh, Tom Hooper Les Misérables. That's where Jean Valjean has been for 20 years, and he looks like it. And he was lucky to have survived. As, as the character's story goes, he's incredibly strong, and that's what it took to survive the prison hulks. Um, so uh, different um, infrastructure, same outcome. And the prison hulks they also used in the American Revolution and the War of 1812. Uh, the British were huge fans of prison hulks. Not only did they use them for prisoners of war, but they also used them for criminals. What about the, say, yes. the French, the Prussians, the Austrians? Similar ideas, obviously, perhaps. The French definitely. Um, it, it, again, you got to have a coast for that, right? Um, the, and, and another advantage uh, to what Dr. Yarado is suggesting is if you have a problem on a prison hulk, all you have to do is sink it, which happened a lot. Um, so yeah, if you're in if you're in a place like Prussia, you do have a coast, right? We tend to forget Prussia has a Baltic coast. Um, I can't speak to the inland German powers like the Austrians, but remember, in Europe, there's a long tradition of quartering. So the state does generally not provide for the housing of soldiers, even through the Napoleonic period. They're they're quartered on the population. So you could conceivably quarter prisoners on a population, but they were eager to exchange them. Uh, and, and you know, pre-Napoleonic warfare tended to go in seasons. So that's what you do in the winter and spring. You exchange all your prisoners. Um, so yeah, there were camps, um, but, but by and large, we're not talking about things the size of Andersonville. That's, that's a new phenomenon. Again, outside maybe of what the British are doing in the Napoleonic Wars. And the thing is, um they do have knowledge about sanitation, right? They understand that the sink should be so far from the camp, from the fresh water. Again, however, with limited resources, limited personnel, limited space, you can only do so much. So I gave kind of an example of where there's barracks and life in those prisons. Andersonville is an open air camp. Um, so there is the only structures are things called shebangs, which are not even tents. Um, they're, you kind of a, put a stick up and then whatever material you'll have over to have kind of a shelter. Um, so people are dying of exposure. Um, it's pretty terrible because again, no, no protection from the elements. 35,000 dudes sleeping in a field. And it's, it's also Southwest Georgia, right? right. Um, I don't even want to go to Southwest Georgia now in the summer, right? <laughs> um, so it's pretty terrible. But thinking about sanitation, so they do follow the rules. There is a freshwater stream. There's a railroad nearby to bring in resources. The prison guards are up further on the hill, farther away. Um, the cemetery is farther away, so you don't have that, um, what do you call, infecting the clean drinking water. It makes sense. However, 
33,000 prisoners. You don't have that many sinks. You have people with dysentery. So overflowing the sinks, and then they start going near the fresh water. Also, people are so weak, it's very difficult to even go back up the hill. I did it, it was even very difficult for me in June to climb up the hill from the fresh water to where the end of the camp would be. Um, so people would just stay down there and defecate and use the water. At one point, the small creek um, on each side could be up to 20 feet of just mud and human feces. Which is not something that you wouldn't not see in a city like New York City. But New York City's been there for centuries. Yeah, so the idea that, oh, there was fresh water. We had sinks. So again, it's very difficult. Um, there is a storm. Now I can't remember when it happens. Please forgive me. Sometime in, I want to say it's early 1865. There is a storm um, that opens a fresh spring in Andersonville. They call it Providence Spring because only God could get into this. Also, Providence Spring, that language only appears in memoirs, not in actual wartime documents. But a fresh water spring does appear, which is going to provide some fresh water for people uh, to take their cups up. And then you hear stories of Confederate prisoner guards shooting the people trying to get fresh water. But, um, again, they try. They do have a plan. They understand basics, but you can only do so much when you have that many people, that much disease, mm -hmm. um, and not many resources. And by, no, by, and no, by the way, you're fighting a war. Also, in 1864, right. 1865, any materials are going to soldiers in the field. They are not going to prisoners in your care. Mm -hmm. I also want to be careful here to note um, there are very high casualties, right? And this is devastating and tragic, but prison guards are also dying as well. Um, so point lookout, people, prison guards are dying of typhus, they're dying of um, dysentery, they're dying of yellow fever, they're dying of malaria. Not to obviously the high rate of prisoners, um, but these some of these camps are just in terrible conditions, and you have the guards also dying as well. So, what are the what are the people in the camps doing to pass the time? What did, what do you learn from studying their narratives? Um, so they read. Um, they will try to get captured documents, or they'll pass books and Bibles around to each other. They establish autograph books. Um, Camp Ford in Tyler, Texas, actually made their own newspaper that you can uh, find online and read. Um, you have uh, music, so you'll have a handful of musicians where they will um, convince them to get them their instruments that they can play, gambling, um, sleeping, right? Uh, trying to write letters. They are allowed to write letters. They are going to be largely censored and limited to one page um, as the war goes on, but they can write letters to family. They find religion, so a number of religious personnel uh, will, and I say that because they could be chaplains, they could be Protestant, they could be, um, there's a number of nuns who especially help out in like the Charleston area. Um, they'll come in, so many people find religion, so they pray, um, they just talk. There are some... Um, not as fun stories where you have like in Andersonville you have a number of people who then start preying on each other's prisoners and they set up gangs uh, people plan escapes that's a big one um, just the idea of thinking about how to escape some people take extra work duty like I said serving in hospitals as cooks as grave diggers as wood collectors yeah they're really trying anything um, to try to survive so let's take uh, I want to look at it go from the prison guard perspective, because you were talking, because you mentioned earlier about retaliatory uh, cutting of rations and whatnot. Yeah, there's retaliation. So let's talk about, like, what is the relationship between, say, the, the prison guards and the prisoners, and then tie in that piece of retaliation, because that, that's a, a concept that has completely fallen out of uh, our um, yeah, um, military. Yeah, so, so let's do prison guards first. <laughs> um, so, again, it depends on what time of the war you're talking about. Initially, uh, prison guards are usually, again, because you don't have that many prisoners, you don't have that many prison camps, it's kind of who's available, right? Um, some people are taken off the front lines and part of their break from combat is to serve as a prison guard. It's kind of seen as an easy gig. Um, at one point, Point Lookout is called like paradise on the point because they're like, oh, we finally get a break. Um, 
As the war goes on, um, and there's high casualties in the field from wounds and um, usually from disease, um, you're going to see conscripts. People who are maybe not seen as who would be best on the front line because of their age, disability. There's a whole invalid corps. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is a, a, a practice that was used in Europe as well. Yeah, this is not new, right? Then because they might not be best on frontline duty or whatever, they're sent as prison guards. Okay, so those maybe sometimes are seen as lesser. Um, but again, sometimes it's just because they were conscripted kind of late in the war. Um, you have a number of northern troops that it's like before they're absorbed, they still need to be trained. And so they're like, hey, while we're training them and we're getting them used to the army, we'll send them to guard prisoners. So you have a number of those. They're, they're very honorable people. They, they want to serve. They're just not full soldiers yet. So poorly trained soldiers guarding people strikes me as a recipe for a problem. Yeah, and then that's going to, so it's going to get worse, right? Because then you're going to have, um, especially in the South, where every able-bodied person is um, serving, you're going to have um, individuals like home guards or local militia, um, older people, people who are maybe considered not... Um, mentally stable guarding prisoners, um, people who are maybe young, um, people as um, as young as 16 guarding prisoners. And so these are the people who really show up as villains in post-war narratives because they, they're they not good enough to be at the front lines. They're kind of the rabble of society, and then they're sent to guard prisoners, which, again, recipe for success. Kind of the nurse ratchet thing. Yeah, and it, they're... I argue that they're more like flat characters in into the post-war period because oftentimes they don't have names. They're just the prison guard, right? They're just the villains. Um, I'm not saying that all of them are, right? Um, there's several examples after the war where prisoners go back to their prison camps, they run into their prison guards, they have picnics, they hang out together, that reconciliationist idea. Um, but there are many stories about... Um, evil prison guards who take advantage, kill, wound, abuse, um, withhold rations, ta- uh, taunt prisoners. So this is kind of just a, a stock archetype? It eventually develop. that's what my argument is, it develops into that. Um, not saying again that there's not stories of prison guards shooting prisoners that do happen, um, but not to the extent, um, or they say like how they would bring in like fresh watermelons and kind of kind of put them in front of the prisoners be like, ooh, you can't have it. But if they had fresh watermelons, they would have been eaten, right? Like there's the idea of taunting prisoners with fresh fruit mm-hmm. in the middle of southwest Georgia is is kind of um, humorous, right? It, mm-hmm. it would not have happened. There's no record of it. But it kind of plays to that archetype of the, the villain. Retaliation. So retaliation is an official policy during the time of the Civil War, Lieber Code. Um Kind of the same thing, if you kill or capture um, and mistreat an African-American soldier that we will do so to a Confederate soldier, that's retaliation. Um, If you put a number of Union prisoners under fire in Charleston, then we will move Confederate prisoners to be under fire near Charleston. Um, if you, if we hear stories of people being starved to death in Andersonville, and we see examples of people who you've all seen the ones that look like skeletons, uh, many of those individuals died within 24 hours of having their photographs taken. As more of those stories are getting back to the federal government, they're like, all right, if you're going to mistreat our soldiers, we are going to retaliate by deliberately lowering rations to get you to increase your rations. What was the Army's reaction to those policies? Because I can see, it. say again? They supported it wholly. Uh, General Pope is the first one to actually propose it as early as 1862. Uh, Benjamin Butler, huge fan of it. Uh, Grant, Sherman, yeah, let them feel the hard hand of war. If they're going to mistreat our um, our enlisted personnel, our officers, then we will mistreat them right back. However, it's not, they're very careful with language. It's not revenge, it's retaliation. Because revenge is from emotion, from passion, unmanly, dishonorable, too animalistic. It's retaliation. It's a logical, rational policy to make sure that people follow the rules of war. And like you were saying earlier with the narratives where the prisoners made it seem like anything bad they did was a response, retaliation is also a response. It's, yes. You are the second mover. Yeah. This is in response to something that you have done and we're trying to get you to um, improve. <laughs> 
on your course of action or stop your course of action. So you, you, you one of the, the major themes you study is the idea of memory, you brought up the lost cause. Um, so what should we take away from all of this? What should, what should we uh, learn and understand about how prisoners of war kind of move forward in the future, both as, a, as people and as a study? Um, I think the biggest takeaway is something that the prisoners I study themselves argue is that they um, serve their country just as honorably and dutifully as those who are not captured. And they should be treated as such. Um, even in our more recent history where you have individuals captured, people dive into the individual's backgrounds. What were they doing when they were captured? Were they being heroic? Were they doing something they shouldn't have been? Um, we might recall Bo Bergdahl there. Yep. Um, and it's prisoners are very much aware of their identity and they want to be treated with respect. They want to be, um, they want pensions just like everybody else. They want access to medical care like everybody else. Um, they want to be acknowledged for their suffering, but they also don't want to be considered lesser for their suffering. So I think we have to remember that, especially as we prepare for maybe um, the next war, large scale combat operations where we might have uh, prisoners of war um, and how they might be treated and how they might be reintegrated in society, realize that they are service members just like other service members and they deserve respect and care. Oh, very good. All right, Dr. Riata, thank you. No, thank you. This was awesome. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips, where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty so you can get to know them.